very good uh, evening today uh, we are going to discuss about minerals let me first increase on put on this presentation mode exactly so in continuation with our lectures on uh, vitamins and minerals and uh, general term uh, generally termed as micronutrients uh, today we will uh, we'll go through and discuss uh, one of the very important minerals called calcium that is very important in your growth development and every other function that we we'll get to understand here so today's learning objective is to explore uh, in two details the calcium uh, L is missing in the spelling as you can see uh, we also want to understand the sources of calcium, explore the effects of chronic low calcium intake. We want to relate calcium to vitamin D and osteoporosis. How does calcium deficiency result into osteoporosis and how is it connected to vitamin D? We will get to understand that and then you know what affects the absorption of calcium, what factors affect them. There are factors that increase the absorption, there are those that reduce the absorption of this. And then we also need to understand the regulation of calcium and the roles of the different hormones that are involved in regulation of this very important uh, mineral in our body. Yes, so uh, to continue, you also have to understand how substances affect calcium. In your body, these substances will include the alcohol, the smoking, oxalates, and later uh, on. And now to continue with this lecture, we say calcium is one of the most abundant divalent cation. I mean, it has two, two. It has a double charge on its uh, ionic form. So on average, about 1.5% of the total body weight is calcium and it's between 1,000 to 1,200 grams in the whole of your body. Imagine inside the bones you have calcium, your teeth you have calcium, in your bloodstream you have calcium everywhere, even in your muscles there are some calcium. So all that results into 1.5% of your total body weight and it's about 100 to 1,200 oh, 1, to 1,200 grams of calcium in your body. The bones and teeth contain the largest percentage of this calcium which is up to around 99% of the calcium that is contained in your body is found in teeth and bones. Uh, it is actually found as the calcium phosphorus ap apatite crystals. And 1% is in the intra and extracellular fluids, the one found in the plasma or the blood, the one found in intracellular fluids, the one found in, uh, in other compartments of the body. Uh, right here is one of the structure of uh, calcium containing compound, that is calcium citrate. Uh, what are the sources of calcium? One, calcium is found in blood. In an ionized form and it is bound in blood into uh, albumin which is a, a carrier protein and the body will compensate for variations uh, sorry about that the body will compensate for this variation Oh, sorry about that. Uh, another source is milk and milk products like cheese and yogurt. Uh, we have fish that uh, some of these fish, especially the sea fish, that uh, oyster, salmon, sardines, because of the small bones. Uh, you can include there the silver fish, so normally called mukene or keje, ngeje, it depends on where you come from. Uh, that's silver fish. And uh, we have dark green leafy vegetables like the greens, the nakati, we have the nakati, sukumas and all those dodo, boga and all of them, the red dodo is called boga somewhere in some language. And uh, that's it, they have broccoli, cards, those are some of the examples. We also have the dried beans and legumes that contain calcium. 
Uh, we have also some calcium fortified foods like tofu, which is the bean curd, uh, that are very important and uh, they can help in that. And the deficiency of calcium is the characterized by calcium tetany, where you have an intermittent spasm of your mus muscles, meaning your muscles get uh, excited at any time you find your muscles trying to, to relax and contract at a given point. So this is caused by low blood calcium concentrations. So they try to relax on anything and you feel like, yeah, this contraction is not really as expected. Intermittent, it relaxes. It contracts, relax, and then stops, and after some time, it does. Intermittent is okay, something that occurs at a given uh, period of time, maybe 30 minutes, or one hour, or something of that kind. Yeah, then uh, toxicity will cause the uh, calcium rigor, where we have the hardness or stiffness of muscles that is caused by high blood calcium concentrations. Yeah, so uh, you get to understand that. So well, what are the functions of calcium in your body? One is in the mineralization of the uh, bones of bones and tooth and it's also important in blood clotting you can see that process when you get to understand uh, vitamin k and uh, prothrombin formation and all that then we get to a sensor it is also a sensor for transmission of nerve impulses uh, you know acetylcholine it is uh, important in that it has a relationship with with calcium in your body and it's also needed for muscle contraction and relaxation. It controls the contraction rhythm and uh, of the heart and all that. And it is also a sensor to control metabolic reactions in all cells. Then the growth may uh, growth and uh, may play a role in maintaining a healthy body weight. As you see that uh, some portion of our body weight is is contributed by calcium being in your different body parts, the bones, the teeth, and uh, even the plasma. So it also regulates release of acetylcholine, which is a neurotransmitter, especially in the muscle junction. Yeah, muscle construction is uh, very good in this. Uh, this actually, it does uh, one of the, the mineral that is trying to regulate the release of inhibit uh, inhibiting or stimulating release of leaves the acetylcholine then it also activate calmodulin uh, a messenger in the cell this is a protein uh, when you get to study the process of muscle contraction uh, you get to understand somewhere that uh, that whole process there requires a substantial amount of your calcium in that process so that your muscles can be able to to relax and contract uh, recently or as expected. The low calcium dance may be related to hypertension as well. So going with the uh, continuing with our lecture ahead, we are seeing calcium uh, deficiency is that one, you have stunted growth as we knew earlier in the functions that calcium is also important for our growth. So if your child do not really have enough calcium, then the growth of that child will be a stunted there is bone loss which is what we call osteoporosis in others where you have deficient amount of calcium in your body then the body has a mechanism of always maintaining the serum levels or the blood levels of calcium constant that if your blood levels of calcium are low maybe due to the deficient intake and any other cause then uh, those that are in the bones can get now are, uh, converted back and uh, are taken into the bloodstream to keep that level of the blood, uh, the blood levels of calcium steady, and this now leaves your bones weak, porous, and uh, poorly uh, mineralized. So that's what we actually call osteoporosis, where your bone is uh, can usually get broken, brittle, and it's not really that strong. Yeah, we have uh, calcium tetany, like we discussed earlier, where which involves the intermittent spasm of extremities your hands, your fingers, uh, your muscles, excitability that is caused by low calcium, low blood calcium concentration. And uh, toxicity, one is the constipation. It also has an increased risk of urinary stones formation and kidney dysfunction. We have calcium stones that can be formed in your body when you have excess of that. And uh, is, uh, calcium stones is one of the examples of uh, uh, kidney stones there. 
there are some in addition to oxide stones and many other forms that affect your kidney and affect it so badly that you may not even survive uh, if you're not given better medical service it's not an easy condition uh, there is an interference with absorption of other minerals uh, in the body once you lack calcium then possibly it affects other minerals too uh, then the calcium rigor we talked about it earlier where your muscles are hard and stiff and they can cause bad pressure let's look into this condition that we have mentioned earlier about uh, osteoporosis uh, this is a basically deficiency of calcium that that have right in two porous bones and it affects up to 80% of the women because these women as they set into they set into menopause there are also a lot of hormonal changes that are help uh, that affects the regulation of the calcium levels in your body and they tend to absorb a lot of this calcium from your bones uh, okay what we call demineralization uh, getting the calcium from your bones into the bloodstream and that can really happen and you find out that they have uh, hips that can easily get broken and up to about 24 percent of hip fracture patients uh, 50 per 50 uh, 50 and over die during the year following their fracture so you have a hip fracture due to this condition about uh, a year most of them die uh, you have uh, spinal vertebrae fractures uh, back pain broken waist and everything those are some of the cases then uh, this can be prevented by an adequate calcium and vitamin d intake uh, given the fact that vitamin D is one of the nutrients that is required for the absorption of, or bio, uh, of calcium or it increases actually the bioavailability of calcium in your body. So you need to take in calcium with your vitamin D and, and that is not really uh, something that is uh, bad for you and it is very good for your health uh, but then you also have to do not taking so much phosphorus because phosphorus and calcium their transportation is all the same and they affect the they affect they affect the intake uh, they affect the absorption of calcium or they affect each other in terms of absorption uh, what are the risk factors that can result into these the osteoporosis uh, we have risk factor and we have protective factors uh, factors that can cause you to get a uh, osteoporosis and uh, and there are also factors that can uh, can uh, can protect you from getting that. Uh, okay. Uh, let's dive into this that on the risk factor if as the older you get the more risk you have for calcium people with low bmi mean uh, bo low body mass index that mean you have very low low weight and everything so we have the causation the asians that is also heritage that is uh, ethnicity uh, where you belong from and hispanic heritage all those people are also at high risk if you smoke cigarettes uh, you also have high risk those who take uh, alcohol and then those who have sedentary lifestyle the strength of your bone is also really weakened and then use of uh, glucocorticoids and anticonvulsants uh, it, and also anticonvulsants can also be a problem so uh, let's dive into the protective factors let's dive into uh, protective factors one is younger age the younger you are the lesser you are exposed to that and then we have the high bmi meaning you, when they say high bmi it doesn't mean you should look for being obese or overweight and everything so we have also other people of african heritage you should actually have a normal bmi before you go to the african heritage uh high bmi your meaning you should have a range of like about 18.5 to 24.9 yeah that's a very good range it doesn't call you to be obese and everything uh we have the african american heritage those are also a group of ethnic group that are good 
So there is also those who don't smoke, if you don't drink alcohol or you take the alcohol in moderation, that is a very good thing and can also reduce your or protect you from getting uh, osteoporosis. And then uh, there's regular weight bearing exercises. You can try to go and do some strenuous exercise regularly. You can go for some gym once or a week, once a week or something like that. Then the use of diuretics here can also protect you from that any train loss or anything uh continuing still with uh with that we say on the uh, risk factor we have the female gender females are more like we saw earlier on that 80 percent of the women are at risk of uh, osteoporosis then the maternal history of osteoporosis the structure or paternal history of a fracture or personal history of fractures if you have all those history during your, your mother has used to have such kind of structure uh, such, such kind of fractures earlier on you are also at that same risk if you are not so keen though this is a rare this is a rare case uh, we have estrogen deficiency in women like we talked about those who get into menopause and menorrhea especially early or surgically induced within they are also at that risk actually then testosterone uh, testosterone deficiency especially in men can also result into this case of osteoporosis and the lifetime diet inadequate in calcium and vitamin d and if all you've been eating doesn't really have uh, this vitamin d or calcium and everything uh, it is also a challenge that it imposes you into the risk of having osteoporosis However, on the other hand, we have also the protective factors that the male gender here is less exposed to that due to uh, other factors like the person not having hormonal, a lot of hormonal changes and everything. Uh, there is no increased requirements, especially during pregnancy and everything. A man don't get pregnant and all that. There is bone density assessment and treatment. Yeah, if you have uh, assessment, you check out what is the... Uh, uh, what is the density of my bones, how packed is it, and you get treated for that. And then if you use estrogen therapy, a uh, therapy where you, you inject it with some estrogen or therapy that helps your body stimulate that uh, estrogen in your body, which is a hormone. Then uh, a lifetime diet, of course, that is rich in vitamin D and calcium can also reduce you or protect you from getting osteoporosis. Uh, let's get into uh, recommendations that are to prevent osteoporosis that you have to uh, eat a balanced diet that is rich in vitamin D and calcium. And uh, DRI is 1000 uh, daily recommended intake. DRI is daily recommended intake of 1000 milligrams for young adults. And then 1200 milligrams for those who are over 51 years. And above so you really need that and you need to take focus on that and then uh, you should uh, you recommend you recommend someone to have a weight bearing exercises where you can see here someone is lifting some some weight and you can go carry dumbbells you can go to the gym and do some good exercise so you, then you can also avoid bone toxins which include cigarettes and then uh, heavy alcohol drinking uh, we have chronic alcoholics who can take alcohol like seriously and they can smoke all the time. Those people are also increasing their risk, but you can recommend all, all those things that they should be avoided because there are toxins actually to the body, not only the bones, much as we are talking about the bones here. So you start building up also healthy bones while young, meaning from childhood you should be able to continue uh, building, uh, consuming the uh, vitamin D rich foods, the calcium rich foods, and you continue to make, to make sure that you're eating those calcium rich foods in your body uh, as recommended. And then uh, you should get a recommended bone density test and medication with appropriate, when appropriate. So you should be able to go and do your bone density assessment and then you can get treatment in it in, in case it's not, it's not very fine. So, uh, uh, what are the factors that uh, what are the factors that affect uh, calcium uh, that favor 
calcium absorption one is that you have adequate vitamin D and this actually enhances the absorption of calcium. Then the calcium binding protein, uh, you should need that, a protein in the intestines that is made with the help of active vitamin D that facilitates calcium absorption. So the intestinal walls can be made of, of all those proteins that uh, binds easily to calcium. And this is made in presence of active vitamin D. That's why you need vitamin D in adequate amounts for you to be able to utilize calcium. Then the acidity of digestive content. This uh, calcium here is one of the nutrients that is very important or, 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 or that is uh, well absorbed. It's bioavailability is uh, increased or easily absorbed in the acidic medium so the the acidic content of your digestive system may help increase the absorption of this uh, nutrient calcium as well and then there's presence of lactose in your body that can help in that uh, absorption then there is the calcium ratio of one or to one or to one to two that would be fine one molecule of calcium one molecule of phosphorus or one molecule of calcium one molecule of phosphorus that would be a very good one so that uh, calcium is not outcompeted during its absorption and if you have a lot of phosphorus in your body like one to four then calcium absorption is up uh, calcium is outcompeted from its active side during its absorption and all that then you will really have to uh, suffer that then there is need for calcium once your body is, is deficient of the calcium or is in need of that calcium it definitely will have the favor it will favor the absorption so easily factors that decrease the uh, calcium absorption or reduces the, the the absorption of calcium is one oxalic acids this one are found in spinach cranberry leafy green vegetables and they bind to calcium preventing the absorption so they bind to this calcium and form actually calcium oxalate which is one a complex that your body cannot even utilize you have phytic acids also which are found in all grain soy and uh, and cereals this one uh, can react with calcium to form what we call the calcium phytate the presence of dietary fat also inhibits or reduces the absorption of nutrients or the absorption of, of calcium to be specific then high protein diets also affects it and then there's an increased gastrointestinal motility that your content of the intestinal tract moves really so fast and doesn't take long and it gets what uh, lost into the waste a lack of exercise dietary fiber caffeine or drugs both iron and uh, zinc all these are the factors that can decrease the absorption of calcium then uh, let's talk about uh, absorption of calcium that about 20 to 35 percent of the calcium intake which is equivalent to around 300 to 350 uh, milligrams is absorbed in the body only these amounts can be absorbed at any one time meaning we have two transport system processes one is saturable and it requires energy and this involves a calcium binding protein called calbidin calbidin and is regulated by calcitriol which is a form of vitamin d3 the active form you see how it's important and the relationship between calcium and vitamin d uh, this is stimulated by low calcium intake, meaning if you have less than 400 milligrams of calcium, especially during pregnancy, lactation, uh, growth, uh, and everything, this occurs in the duodenum and proximal jejunum. And uh, so this, this is basically the first way or the first transport process of calcium, that it is one is saturable and it can be saturated at any point, and it occurs uh, in the... Uh, by help of uh, calbidin, a protein that is found in your body, uh, calcium binding, and then it is also regulated by calcitriol, and then uh, so it's stimulated also by ca low calcium intake. You have low calcium intake, uh, or your body is deficient of some calcium levels, it's beyond the RDA, or what your body needs, especially during pregnancy, lactation, and uh, growth. You have an increased requirements for this, and yet you taken maybe normally and then uh, the requirement may not be met and this process takes place in the duodenum and the and the second uh, transport process is that it is non-saturable and it is passive it is absorbed between cells rather than through them 
and it occurs in jejunum and the ileum. So this absorption takes place passively, does not require energy, however the organ is energy consuming. And so this is uh, one that uh, occurs between cells rather than through them. So uh, between two cells, the calcium can get passed through it and there passively. So bacteria in the colon releases calcium from fermentable fiber and 4% of the dietary calcium is absorbed by the colon as well. So in the colon where fermentation takes place, so some of this fiber releases its calcium up to around 4%. What's the role of calcitriol in calcium absorption? Calcitriol, like we understood, one is an active form of vitamin D. So calcitriol is formed in response to an increase in that arrow pointing up means an increase. Uh, an increase in a uh, parathyroid hormone, which is PTH. And hopefully you, you get to remember that. PTH here is parathyroid hormone. And this results because of the decrease in plasma calcium. So calcitriol here you will induce the synthesis of calbidin, uh, the protein we talked about that is calcium binding, and then calbidin here will shuttle now, will shuttle or carry, transport the calcium through the cells. It goes through the cells, not in between cells. And then calcium extrusion from cells into blood requires the ATP and a vitamin D regulated calcium magnesium ATP enzyme. So this calcium is pumped out as magnesium is pumped in. So that is an interchange of this uh, the deregulated vitamin D regulated calcium magnesium ATP enzyme. So it pumps out the calcium. It pumps um, in magnesium and then calcium is also pumped out of the cells. So sodium is also exchanged for calcium in the extrusion process. So there's an interchange of ions here that the sodium and our calcium. They interchange themselves. Cal Calcitriol here regulated absorption is impeded by age and estrogen deficiency. So age also affects this process of calcium. So let's look at homeo homeostasis of calcium. How is calcium kept uh, regulated in the body? How is it kept constant at that level? Uh, one is that 99% of the calcium is found in your skeleton, your bones, your teeth and everything. And then 1%, this 1% here, which is remaining, is very critical to indispensable life processes. It's very important in your life. And the body will always have to keep it at constant or at a steady state. That uh, regulation of blood calcium concentration is achieved through parathyroid hormone, which is PTH, like we saw earlier. Uh, 125 dehydroxyvitamin D, which is our calcitriol. We, we saw it just briefly before we came to this slide, and then calcitonin. Then let's look into parathyroid hormone. What does parathyroid hormone, the PTH, do in our in the process of calcium homeostasis? Is that in the kidney, the parathyroid hormone here increases hydroxylation of the 25 hydroxyvitamin D to 125 hydroxyvitamin D, which is the most active form of calcitriol. Uh, the active vitamin D. So meaning the PTH here increases the hydroxylation and this hydroxylation process which occurs in the kidney helps in activating the vitamin to its active form. So that is a very important and then the calcitriol here will cause the uh, once the vitamin has been activated and it's what we call the calcitriol will now cause the production of calbidin in the intestine, a protein that we looked about it earlier, that it is a binding, where uh, it binds to calcium. So this will increase the absorption of calcium. So parathyroid hormone here indirectly influences absorption, uh, just like the way you've seen how it is results into activation of calcitriol or vitamin D, uh, which will now also cause the production of calbidin, uh, calbidin uh, in the intestine and uh, increasing the absorption. So PTH, parathyroid hormones here, increases the reabsorption of calcium by the kidney tubules. And what happens in the bones? That was in the kidney. So what happens in the bones is that the parathyroid hormones here interact with osteoclasts. What are osteoclasts? These are cells that help in the uh, release or conversion, release of this uh, uh, calcium from bones, what you call bone resorption. So these cells here promote bone resorption meaning the calcium will be released to blood from the skeletal system in your bones, in your tooth and everything, all that calcium. Once these osteoclasts are activated, they tend to carry this 
to convert this calcium into usable form in a usable, usable form in your bloodstream. The opposites, the, the antagonistic cells of osteoclast are osteoblast. They do the other way around, may they help in mineralization of the bones, meaning they take the calcium from blood into uh, into our bones or the skeletal system. A question can come in that way. And uh, you may not have seen osteoblast in our slides and then uh, you have chopped uh, understanding this lecture or you skipped it and then now you realize the question have appeared somewhere and you couldn't answer. Maybe MCQ or even a very short form of question. So we have low plasma calcium and high phosphorus diet also increases the parathyroid hormone. So the more you take on the, the low calcium yeah, and then uh, high phosphorus, this will stimulate the production of parathyroid hormone in your body. Let's talk about calcitriol here. That the calcitriol here increases the transcription of genes for calbidin, which binds and transport calcium in the intestinal cell. We talked about uh, the protein synthesis earlier and the process of transcription, translation, and everything. So calcitriol here will go and affect the, the process of transcripting uh, for a particular protein, which is called calbidin. So it will result into the formation of this very protein called calbidin with that will bind to calcium and transport it in the intestinal cells. So cal calcitriol here into, induces changes in the brass borders and the basolateral membrane of uh, uh, of our intestine. So if those changes occur, it will directly result into an increased absorption of uh, calcium. The, so calcitriol is involved in calcium uh, reabsorption in the kidney and calcitriol is also involved in the calcium reabsorption in the bones. You can imagine. So a question can come that what is the role of calcitriol in uh, calcium absorption? Then you can have, you see the blue thing here is that a blue, the, this blue kind of box that I've put here is that it promotes calcium absorption in the intestine, like we have seen here, where it ch induces some changes in the brass borders and the basolateral membranes, so that it can enhance directly the, the direct absorption of that. It also enhances bone reabsorption of calcium, uh, is also in the kidney, which is here. Reabsorption of that in the renal tubular uh, reabsorption of calcium. Calcitonin, lastly, one of the uh, I think that regulates is that it is produced by chief cells. Uh, this is definitely in our stomach. Chief cells are found there, uh, unless otherwise. And then uh, chief cells and in the thyroid is an antagonist of, and it is an antagonist of uh, parathyroid hormone, meaning it production is stimulated by high serum calcium levels. So this calcitonin in here will inhibit bone resorption and uh, increases bone or deposition of calcium into the bones. So uh, this is exactly what it does, meaning when uh, a calcium level goes high, it will stimulate the production of calcitonin that will help in uh, reducing the uh, inhibiting bone resorption, meaning no calcium will be gotten out from the bones or your skeletal system, but more will be gotten from your blood or serum into the bones and they deposited there. Uh, so what is the role of vitamin D in calcium absorption like we have talked about it earlier. So from by now you should have understood now what it truly really is. So vitamin D causes the, causes the synthesis of calcium binding protein, the calbidin that we talked about earlier, and this will increase the absorption in the intestine. So what's here? We talk about the summary of this regulation here. And right where the green is on the left side, we are having the rising blood calcium levels. The, when the, the serum levels are so high, it will signal the thyroid gland to secrete the hormone calcitonin, uh, to secrete calcitonin. So this calcitonin here will tend to inhibit the activation of vitamin D. Vitamin D will not be activated. Once vitamin D is not activated, no synthesis of calbidin. So calcitonin here will prevent calcium reabsorption in the kidney as well. And then it will also limit the calcium reabsorption in the intestine. It will also inhibit osteoclast cells. And I think it will stimulate the, the osteoblast cells. So meaning they try all these activities here will tend to lower the calcium levels in your blood. Uh, yeah, which inhibits calcium, calcitonin uh, secretion. Once the calcitonin, uh, your calcium levels goes down, calcitonin secretion will stop. 
And uh, then now, what if now your blood levels falls right so low below? What is really required is that it will signal your parathyroid gland to secrete the parathyroid hormone, the PTH. These parathyroid hormones here will do the exact opposite of calcitonin. That is to make vitamin D and it results into synthesis of the calbinin and then uh, uh, increases the reabsorption of calcium in the kidney, in the intestines. And also, it is stimulates osteoclast. Exactly now, we have gotten the osteoclast cells here uh, to break down bones, releasing calcium into the blood. And also, it will start inhibiting your osteoblast. Osteo. It will start uh, uh, stimulating osteoblast cells. So, here, this axon right in uh, purple here will tend to. Or raise your blood sugar or blood calcium levels. Uh, in summary, here if blood calcium level is too high, the rising blood calcium level signals the thyroid gland to secrete calcitonin. Then the calcitonin will lower your blood calcium by stimulating osteoblast to build in new bones using calcium from the blood. You hopefully have understood. This still is the same summary of everything right up there and. Uh, I wouldn't really take more time here because you know normal levels of calcium uh, here, 10 milligrams per day. So what are the effects of chronically low calcium intake? Well, what if you take so little in your calcium? Chronically means over a long period of time, can be years, can be decades, can be anything. From childhood, you've been taking very little calcium levels. What happened is that this will uh, an increased blood parathyroid hormone concentration will result and when it's persistent then what does parathyroid hormone do what is the effect on bones uh, i won't be able to explain this because we have just learned it so you should be able to relate to the previous uh, lecture now uh, or to the previous slides up there uh, you should be able to increase uh, it, there is an increase in bone resorption uh, if you take less more your bone uh, your bones can uh, calcium will be broken down and released so that it can get into your blood serum levels and that can affect the bone turnover so there will be more more calcium being released from bones and less that can be put in to replace the calcium that is what is called a turnover now there is a reduction in bone mineral content meaning and density meaning your bone will be very light because and then it will also have very little content it will not be compact that makes it brittle and easily breakable there is an increased risk of fractures of uh, trabecular and cortical bone tissue in uh, in uh, bones that this basically is, is about the, the around the hip area and, and that is basically it and the arms and everything, the, uh, the shoulder ripples and everything. So there will be an increased risk of osteoporotic fractures. So the, those are fractures that are resulting from osteoporosis. Let's talk about calcium and other substances, starting with caffeine as one of the substances. That This caffeine here is one that increases urinary uh, calcium excretion. Uh, you can add this to one of the factors that decreases calcium absorption as caffeine and uh, you should limit it up to around 400 milligrams daily. Uh, what's that? About 100 milligrams uh, per 6 hours of coffee. So that is also equivalent to around 40 milligrams per 6 hours of regular brewed tea. And maybe less for green tea because there is less in brewing green tea. In coffee, you have up to around 100 milligrams of caffeine. And in a regular brunch tea, you have up to around 40 milligrams per six hours. And then you have less in green tea. That's why green tea is one of the tea that has been advisable for so many people. So some soft drinks are comparable to tea because they have also a little of the caffeine. Uh, we also have some medications uh, like aspirin. Uh, soft drinks, actually, energy drinks like uh, stink also have that and many other more energy drinks that we have that have been marketed actually so seriously in the, in the market currently for people to boost their energy uh, rock boom is one of them actually that is very common uh, especially in these east african countries including uganda even south sudan so 
and Kenya also has them, so that is also one of the things. Uh, they contain also some caffeine in it, that's why you don't really take uh, sleep. It keeps you active. Then uh, consumption of alcohol, that is uh, more than seven drinks per week, is associated with greater risk of low bone density for uh, falls fractures, meaning if you take uh, one, one bottle of uh, alcohol every day, you, meaning by the end of the in by the end of the seven days in the week you have taken the seven of them then that is also one of the risks and it can affect you uh it is unfortunate that some people can even sit and consume a crate in one day meaning they have consumed over two weeks three one month actually if that can reach 24. sodium is also one of the thing i think we earlier saw it in one of the in one of our slides up there now it can also increase the urinary calcium excretion and the recommended upper limit of 2400 milligrams per day is what you have to take okay. oxalic acid was one of them which is found in spinach chard beet greens and chocolate like we talked about earlier so this binds to calcium and it doesn't seem to affect us calcium in other foods including chocolate milk uh, this this green still is good for you and uh, may help calcium absorption in other ways. And so with this I want to say thank you very much for today and we have come to the end of our lecture but we should be able to know that our learning objectives at the end of everything should be achieved and understood very well. So let's get to know this and uh, questions can come about that and we should get to understand them. Thank you very much.